Hello and welcome to Robin Mind. My name is Hero Daniels. Many thanks for joining us. Um, as I was driving down to the studio, I noticed that we still have very long lines of empty tanks, you know, just waiting to buy fuel at the NNPC fleeing station. Um, I don't think Nigerians have actually adapted to the new reality, which is the fact that, you know, fuel is very, very expensive, you know. I was having a conversation with a friend the other day, and my friend was like, this time around, that father-in-laws and, you know, people that want to give away their daughters are now adding fuel price, um, sorry, gallons of fuel to their bride price. That's how bad the situation has gotten. Um, so we really want to break down the fall crisis that we're experiencing in the country, Nigeria's fall shortage crisis and the struggle for economic stability. And um, I'm privileged to have very renowned experts in the studio. Um, first, Associate Director, Human Capital Partners, Shehu Zubairo. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> also joining us virtually uh, is an energy policy analyst, Adiola Yusuf. Welcome to the program. So, um, Mr. Shehu, First of all, um, let's, let's talk about the, let's address the elephant in the room. Okay. Why do we have fuel shortage in a country that is so rich in oil? It still doesn't make sense to a lot of people. Yeah, um, it doesn't make sense to a lot. And um, once again, again, good afternoon, viewers. Um, the entire structure of that system called um, NMPC, you know, is one of the major challenges. NNPC is a fantastic organization. However, it has a lot of structural challenges. And they have been saddled with a mandate to ensure fuel security and availability. And I think in that area, they have failed. If you look at um, the newspapers of the 80s, you'll see fuel queues. And up until today, we still have fuel issues. That's to tell you that in that matrix, with regards to performance, they have not done well. But instead of casting stones directly at them, let's also look at the major challenges they also have. You know, as an organization that is saddled with that humongous responsibility, I suspect that NNPC is not very clear about their mandates. You know, just in 2021, they have been asked to function as a limited liability company, which I'm sure you are aware of. And um, the sole aim of a limited liability company is to drive profit. But NNPC have actually served more like um, a social economic engine for the nation. So it drives social economic initiatives. And so um, there seems to be some contrast in their mandate mm. as a key driver of social economic um, initiatives in Nigeria, especially this ever event of wealth subsidy, and then, of course, a profit liability company. So you find out that striking that balance becomes a major challenge. So in terms of wealth scarcity, I don't know if it's going to go out go out immediately because they are also confused. So you see different policies that comes out today that says that, you know, the government is expected to ensure fuel so, um, availability. Yeah. And then later on, you now find out again that they are having issues with um, liquidity because you can't give one and then get the other. You just have to give one for, for the okay. other. So, so that's a challenge. So, so let's break things down. Okay. Um, like I said earlier, Nigeria is a nation that is rich in oil. <laughs> We did have refineries that worked. Yes, we did. What happened to those refineries? And for every dispensation, they say, okay, you know what? We're going to fix these refineries yeah. up. Billions of Naira being allocated, yes. and it's like we're back to square one. So, so um, the, the situation is, is Nigeria, actually. I think it has a lot to do with our core values as a country, what it has eventually become, even though we don't agree with the fact that that is really what defines us as a people. Look at every other sector in the country and what corruption has done to it. You'll find out that we have very beautiful infrastructure, we have very beautiful systems, but for some reason, performance is not really one of the things that we are very good at churning out, probably because we have very strong individuals and we don't have very strong institutions you know, that will regulate the kind of performance that we expect from most of the investments that we get. So yes, um, the challenge here is we as a people, what exactly drives us as a nation? What do we reward as a nation? What do we hold accountable as a nation? These are things that I'm not sure we have fully addressed. And so any system where these values are not really driven by may not necessarily perform. And NMPC <coughs> is not the oil and gas sector generally. I don't want to use the word NMPC now. The oil and gas sector is not isolated from these core challenges. Any system you find yourself where these values are not held 
in um, in high esteem, then you will have challenges. So, in other words, you're saying that even as a body, yes. you know, the entire system has cases of alleged corruption. So, corruption because is one of them. Corruption is a major challenge. But even the entire business DNA of the oil and gas sector, I think, has to be restructured. You know, um, yes, you will agree, I agree with you that corruption is a major issue. But corruption is in every other sector. Okay. Yeah, it's in every other sector of the, of the economy. And if you look at the, as you see, the elephant in the room, the oil and gas industry, the reason why we are talking about it is because it affects you and I. It affects the average person on the street. But if you look at other industries that don't affect people directly, maybe indirectly, these same issues exist. Mm. You know, these same issues exist in terms of corporate governance of the entire body, the entire mm. structure. Those are challenges we may need to look at. Right. And once that is not in place, corruption now becomes, you know, um, a major indices that we find very difficult to cope. Okay, let's pick the thoughts of Adiola. Um, Adiola Yusuf, energy policy analyst, is joining us uh, virtually. So we want to talk more about the policies um, in the oil sector. So we've had several policies from one government to another, and it seems like of all the policies that they've all formulated, we don't have anyone that is really efficient because the results speak for itself. What do you make of the policies that we've had over the years? What do you make of the, what do you make of the policies, uh, the government's policies in the oil sector, Adiola? All right, so um, yeah, I'm finding it be, it's a bit of a challenge connecting with Adiola. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's go further. Uh, yes, please. All right. You see, there's this regular comment that says that, you know, um, culture at any time will eat strategy for breakfast. Mm. And I think that's the issue. You know, it doesn't matter how fantastic the policy is or how bad it may look. Once the culture of the people that drive this policy is not in place, then that entire policy may not work. I've also seen situations where we have some assaulting of policies. You have asked um, the major oil and gas company in Nigeria to manage performance in terms of revenue because they are bringing in forex into the country. The major business of the NNPC is bringing forex into the country. And then you are also asking them, on the other hand, to generate subsidy. These are two contrasting things. It's not very easy to strike that balance. You know? And so it requires a lot of you know, policy review and, of course, culture. The culture of the people that drives it. What exactly is that culture? Have we cleared, clearly stated that out? You know, in terms of decision making, in terms of the business structure, you know, in terms of how performance is being measured and rewarded, all of these things come into play when we are implementing any policy. And if for any reason, you know, the culture is not in full alignment with the policy, then everything will collapse. You know, it doesn't matter how big the organization or how small, the policy is going to collapse. So yes, the government has come out to say, you know what, we want to end subsidy regime. But you see, um, as good in quote as they say the policy may look, just because, you know, the country has actually been brought to its knees, you know, as a result of um, the so economic so situation we found yeah. ourselves. You know, implementation of that policy is my own concern. There is a way to implement a change. And in every standard change initiative, you know, it has to come with some structure and plan. You know, um, change can either be radical or it can be incremental. So how exactly are we trying to mitigate the effects of some of this change? Did we do a proper risk assessment or risk analysis on the implication of the change? Um, if we probably did, I want to believe that the people in power probably did. But if they did it well, then we should have envisaged some of the challenges that would have come up afterwards and then find a way to mitigate them. So it looks as though we don't have a plan. We just implemented the policy and there is absolutely no plan on how to mitigate the challenges that come up. So these are my concerns. Yeah. As fantastic as the policy is, to me, is really not my issue. But how do we go about implementing it? And what culture are we using to drive that? Mm. That's my, really, my, my, my major concern here. Interesting. Yeah. Now, um, I understand where you're coming from. We've obviously seen the effect. Yeah. It's obvious that the government took the radical route, you know, because yeah. it was just... <laughs> The president came in, he was sworn in, and the first thing he said was, subsidy yes, is gone. Subsidy <laughs> is gone. Um, yes, with the Dangote refinery, a lot of people's hopes went up, and they're, they're having conversations around whether the fuel will be cheaper. Now, the NNPC is obviously the sole buyer from Dangote refinery, so they set the price according 
to Dangote. So, in fact, there was a lot of drama that happened with that. Let's speak at your last thoughts okay. on the, the, the Dangote refinery and its impact on the economy. Adiola? What do you think of Dangote refinery and its impact on oh, our economy? Good afternoon, and I'm very happy to be on the program. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, it, 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 of course, I love the way you, you know, I think paraphrase the Dangote Dubeco, the Dangote refinery Dubeco, about the hope by Nigerians that the price of the commodity will come down immediately Dangote, um, you know, refinery is on board. And everyone has been able to say I've on, on occasion said that, um, you know, that will be the lie from the pit of hell. I've said it on several television stations, national and global. And the simple reason is that, you know, this is economics, this is not politics. The, the production cost at Dangote Refinery was higher than the amount the product was being sold at the filling station as at that time. As at the morning of the day, petrol was, I mean, uh, Dangote Refinery started producing petrol. The production cost was far higher. So that will tell you clearly that this is not politics, this is business. If we, we were here where, you know, I like the Alipo Dangote, even clamoring or, you know, conversing, total removal of subsidy. What that will mean is that if the, the subsidy is totally removed, there is no undercurrent, there is no under recovery, there is no differential. What that will mean is that the price of this commodity will still go higher. Everyone knows that, you know, energy is expensive globally. If you have, we have friends, we have people, viewers around the world, they will tell you a liter of petrol, how much it is petrol, or petrol is sold in the UK, in the US, and all that. So what removal of subsidy will mean is that there's going to be a free market operation. Or, you know, so what that will mean is the, the production cost can never, ever be lower than the retail cost. Uh, but fact has been established that there's nothing like, you know, petrol price to come down if Dangote is on board. Uh, fine, there's a lot of things that we can say around Alaji Ali Kodango. There's a Nigerian uh, that has done what any other Nigerian has never done, and you can quote me on this. Uh, he's the first Nigerian to build a refinery of 650,000 uh, you know, barrel capacity, uh, the, the, the largest single unit refinery in the whole world. And, and he's citing this on Nigerian soil. He has invested, according to you know, statistics, over, I mean, 20 million dollars. I mean, $20 billion in this investment. That was a time Dangote Refining was the biggest investment in the whole world. Sorry to cut you short. Sorry to cut you short. I, I really need us to, because at the end of the day, we are talking from the perspective of the people, and it's very important that I'm glad that you've been able to educate um, that it's, it's an ed economic conversation, you know, not necessarily a political or an emotional conversation. However, we cannot take policy politics away from it. Um, Nigerians are saying they cannot afford three square meals anymore. And a lot of people are of the school of thought that the monies gotten from the subsidy is not necessarily invested totally into infrastructure and sort of booming and boosting the economy. Small businesses, medium scale businesses are suffering. So people are saying, you know what, the government should bring back the subsidy and it's better we know that fuel is cheaper so that we can survive and sort of run our small businesses. What do you make of that? Thank you very, very much. You can never ever blame a Nigerian that goes around with this kind of perspective for two reasons. The first one quickly is that this pro Nigerians have suffered a lot. And, you know, we have it on record, the effort by forefathers of Nigeria to ensure that Nigerians are not suffering the way we are suffering now. But that reason being that um, you know, crude oil that you're talking about that's been priced globally is a, is, a, is a commodity produced on Nigerian soil. We have refineries that are supposed to be refining crude oil in Nigeria. Then number three, that is a 445,000 barrels capacity in final, you know, allocation of crude oil to those refineries. So there has, there has been this arrangement, even in, you know, enshrined in the PIA, that that 445,000 have been the total capacity of the refineries that Nigeria has to end uh, One in, I mean, two in that spot, one in one, uh, and one in Kaduna. You know, if we are, you know, producing crude oil and we are locating this to these four refineries and they are working, it means that Nigerians shouldn't even be bothered about the international price of crude oil. That is number one reason that you can never ever pay Nigerians for it. The number two reason is the, the, the oil industry is 
one industry that is not understood by Nigeria, or we have need to understand it. Maybe this is deliberate on the part of the policymaker, those that are willing us. And uh, maybe when you do not understand this industry very, very well, and you, know, you won't have the right right as the right person. And this is what brings bring it, you know, what should be the right advocate for Nigeria. Uh, of course, it is not wrong for us to say own subsidy. If government can afford it. But what is I think is better is for everyone now to start asking questions about the crude oil, I mean about the refine oil refinery that we have in Nigeria, four hundred and forty five thousand barrels of them. Over 10 years ago, 10 years ago, none of them has produced a lick of petrol. And go and check. They are spending a lot of money when it comes to, you know, uh, recurrent expenditure, salaries, training abroad, and all that and all. This refinery should be brought back to, you know, life. Nigerians should demand. If I've been saying with the enthusiasm and the effort of the president, yes. I don't want are you coming to explain Adiola, just that hold that thought. I, I understand how passionate you are. Um, we have less than three minutes. And you made very valid points. Um, you asked the very important question, which leads me to my next question, because we really need to wrap up this segment. <laughs> there have been conversations around alleged oil cabals, that these are the people holding the oil sector to ransom. You know, we saw a, a snippet of, you know, what happened with the whole Dangote versus, you know, federal government and all of that drama that happened. What do you make of this? And what is the way forward for Nigeria? You see, um, where you have very strong individuals as against strong institutions, then the issue of the cabal becomes a concern. You know, I, I think we need to have a very strong corporate governance system around the oil and gas sector. If that happens, then the issue of the cabals may likely go off. Because in the same country, we have an LNG. And because of the business structure of an LNG, it's still surviving. Where are, the, where are the cabals? You know, it's just about the entire business structure within the oil and gas sector that I think that if we have very strong institutions to manage, then to address some of these concerns. The issue with Dan Gauthier and um, NMPC, look, Dan Gauthier is a businessman, and he is there to make profit. His mandate is completely different from that of um, NMPC. Even though NMPC now, trust me, their, their mandate is also to make money. Right from 2021, looking at the PIA bill, is to make money. You know, the idea of NMPC functioning more like a social economic vehicle for the government is far gone. And that's the reason why you are looking at the issue of the subsidy going. All right, but it is in how government now uses the revenue generated by NMPC to better your life and my life. That is really where the concern is now. So there is a conflict in the mandate of NMPC as against that of Dangote. Dangote is to make money. Let's not think Dangote is going to help the economy of this country. That's not his mandate. His mandate is to ensure that his shareholders get profit for the money that he has made and also pay for the loans that he has acquired. That's his mandate. So anybody thinking that Dangote is going to help Nigeria make you know, fuel cheaper, mm -mm. maybe a more competitive environment could help. And that will come over time. But this monopoly that we have, where it is just one single buyer, and then right. they determine the price, is really where I think we have a lot of challenges. Okay. We need to look at the entire structure of we the oil and gas sector. We have to wrap it up, but thank, thank you, you so much for coming on to the program. Thank um, you this very is much. a conversation that we really need time to sort of unpack, but thank Absolutely. you so much for your contribution. Thank Adiola you. Yusuf, thank you so very much for coming on the program as well. Um, yeah, have a lovely afternoon. Robin Mind continues after this break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Robin Mind. Uh, before we went on the break, we were having a conversation about the oil sector and what the government needs to do to ensure that there's enough fuel and, of course, it's affordable to all Nigerians. And right now, we want to talk about the youth. As you know, Robin Mind is the number one youth program on the entire continent, and it's very important that we bring to you matters that involves the youth. And that is what I want to talk about this campaign called the Youth Day of Service. Now, I want to raise awareness about the Youth Day of Service, its impact, and the role it plays in promoting youth-led sustainable development across Africa. And with me to discuss this is the director, Leap Africa, the executive director, pardon me, Leap Africa, Kehinde Ayeni. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Okay, so let's just train into it. So what is Youth Day of Service? Well, the Youth Day of Service is an annual campaign that is meant to elevate the spirit of volunteerism. And it's one way that Leap Africa has sought to bring together African youth through um, a vehicle that we believe can actually elevate their voices when it comes to the awareness of the sustainable development goals, their participation of it, and also in policy and dialogues that really influence how young people see themselves in matters 
that really concern them and the environment in which they live and thrive in, whether it is for businesses or whether it is for them to thrive as an individual. But, you know, the unit of service is the organization's idea for how we see the world in which young people thrive. So, but I'll start by explaining who Leap Africa is and why we, we thought about it in the first place. So Leap Africa is a non-profit organization and our work essentially is to raise and bridge some gap that we've identified limits youth transitions. As you know, not every young person that um, is above the age of 18 will go on to tertiary education or would find their place in life easily and we have found that there are five areas in which we want to focus our energy in bridging the youth development gap and that is in education, employability, entrepreneurship, active citizenship, mental health and well-being. Mm -hmm. And for us, we think that it's best to um, catalyze change agents um, through several mediums. So for us, the UDL service is one campaign that we've taken outside of Nigeria. The first Amazing. year it was done here mm -hmm. in Nigeria, but subsequently in the last four years, uh, I think this is the fifth year, actually. We've gone into African countries, and we've been able to mobilize thousands of Africans through different community projects mm. um, with the goal that we give them opportunity to work within the Sustainable Development Goals. So in, in all of this amazing work, I mean, the, the campaign started in 2020, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, it has expanded to several African countries. Mm -hmm. So in the course of engaging the youths, yes. uh, the volunteers and the people that are in charge and all of that, what has been that major challenge that affects the African youths or the African youth is always faced with? They think that they are, um, that we are not mindful they feel people, the stakeholders who are responsible for them are not mindful about them, mindful about their challenges, mindful about their well-being, their state of affairs. They're not mindful about what their contribution could be to society and how they can really build the nation. So when we started the Youth Day of Service, it's with that consciousness at the back of our mind to see how can we excite young people? How can we respond to this big question of where are the young people? How can we engage them and pull their resources together? A young person is, is agile, is creative, is innovative, is creative, um, is dynamic, is innovative. But how can we pull all of that together? And what we found common from, from Nigeria to Malawi to Sudan to any part of Africa is that young people want to do something. They want to be engaged. They want to they want to give their voice, their treasure, their talent, their tools, mm. their resources, whatever it could be, into something that is worthwhile. You mm. know, it's not all about fun and games. Mm. It's not so much about money in their pockets alone, but how can they be um, individuals that make a lot of sense so of it, the situation around them? So you're walking down the streets of Lagos. Yes. You're going to see like bundles of talent. Sometimes you're just there and then somebody walks up to you, a young person, and the person is like, sir, can I rap for you? Yeah. Or sir, can I do something for you? Mm -hmm. So you can see that there's an eagerness. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it looks like, you know, the economic realities of the country is weighing down on the young person, mm -hmm. especially the young people of Africa. Mm -hmm. I was having a conversation with a friend the other day and you know, we're saying how disadvantaged we feel when we measure ourselves with our counterparts in the Western countries. Yeah. So how do you think the private sector, the governments, uh, the public sector can collaborate to sort of empower young people? And what is your organization doing about that? So one big way that the private sector, public sector and the development sector, because that's where I come from, mm. meet together is to identify platforms that really resonate with young people. Mm -hmm. When you identify the platform, then you can actually provide the support that is required. Sometimes the support is not financial. It could just be in infrastructure. It could just be the place of a hub. It could be in anything. Uh, it could just even be an endorsement. When we started out the Youth Day of Service, the Minister of Youth and Development was at our press conference. It was the perfect leverage that we really needed to say that the minister endorses this. The minister agrees that we should have a campaign that moves beyond a day or a month. By the way, I must say that we decided to do it within the auspices of the United Nations International Youth Day. And it's that because you do not just celebrate one day for young people. There has to be more than a day, a milestone that young people are knocking down. And so the private sector bring a lot to the table. The public sector bring a lot to the table. And the social, social development sector bring a lot to the table. And for us as development partners, um, we also have to bring in other partners. Mm. This, the day of service has about 80, 80 organizations partnering with us 
as an institution. But then when you take it down to individuals and organizations that receive the support or are already keyed into it, they also leverage communities and organizational institutions at their levels. Mm. So your organization has engaged about 17,780 um, yes. volunteers, volunteers um, across about 703 projects in there. Absolutely. Um, that's a very impressive number. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you think we can triple that number, maybe X times 10 that number? Because imagine if you could do 2 million, you know, 10 million. So yes. what do you need? What does your organization need? Not like I have money to give, but what do you guys need? Yes, you're very right that the, the money is the, is the perfect place to start. Mm. Um, when we started, we had little or no funding, thanks to one of our partners. But consistently, one of our partners, Dow, um, has given us $100,000 to do this annually. Each year we get that amount of money. But if we can do so much with about 400,000, when you, when you talk about the impact that we've been able to um, galvanize across the SDGs, then there's more money needed for that. And the money goes into the, the sub-grant, which is the amount that goes into food drives, planting trees, cleaning the environment, providing books to, to schools, and so many other initiatives. So those are the kind of initiatives that come up and money needs to go into it. Sometimes also, there are donations from the project owners. So you and I could, could start a project, and the money comes from you and I. It's not just from Leap Africa that brings the funds. So mm. there's a lot that is required for this. We're talking about thousands and potentially millions mm. for this kind of project to be sustainable. And when you even distill the kind of um, projects we've seen or the, the reach we've had in 40 countries and counting, we want to, to deepen that. We want our, our footprints not to be just one project or two in a country, but one that is really sustained. And so we are looking for collaborators. We are looking for financial sponsors um, mm. for this. And of course, we want infrastructure that can really allow us to move um, successfully and sustainably within um, the projects that we have run in. Mm. But maybe the last thing is also for the government to see what they can do as they own a, a huge chunk of the sustainable development goals. If you look at the index, we are far behind in where we should be in Africa. Uh, when you look at Nigeria alone, it's devastating. But when you even begin to isolate it from Botswana to all these other countries, it's even more staggering. So there's a lot to be done. Our government needs to um, also check where are the gaps within the index. Mm -hmm. When you talk about healthcare and education and other things, and then together we can map up a strategy and approach, but already the development goals give us a good platform to do that. Okay, so now that leads me to my next question, because most often than not, when young people go out there to make impact in communities, especially underprivileged communities, mm -hmm. there's always a culture shock in the sense that you come to a community that there has not been a well built in several years, mm -hmm. and you're trying to build a well. And some community leaders mm -hmm. or some youths of the community would say, you cannot do this unless you pay this. Yes. Have you ever experienced such? Oh my goodness, that's a, a common place for us. And we have found that the best way before we can go into a community is to even sensitize the community ads or leads or whatever they may be. They, they come in all kinds of names. You must, you must first of all tell them, this is what we want to do. And this is what the benefit is. Because when people don't understand the benefit, then there is higher resistance. When they understand the value and the contributions, then they welcome you with open arms. And it's not even unique um, to one community, one region or the other. It's across board. So what we have perfected over time is to start our work from the top. Before you go into a community, you've mapped out the need. You know who you need to talk to and then what you need to deploy, how long you'll be there for. And also increase the ownership quotient by inviting them to be a part of it. If they own a portion of it, the responsibility of the sustainability of it, then you see that they are more willing. Then they know it's for them. And in some places, you might have to pull out because that's the truth of the matter. When there's a lot of resistance, you may have to pull out one day to go back another day to say, now we are back. We really want to do this for you. This is what is happening. Mm -hmm. And Nigerians were competitive. When something is working in one place and you say, if you look at your neighbor, your brother, your sister in this community or that local government, they are doing this and that, then they want to be a part of it. So that's mm. also part of how we manage such situations. Mm. And then how do you manage situations of 
possible corruption where perhaps uh, there's a particular leader in that community that has been benefiting from grants mm. supposedly allocated to that project. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so many times we hear stories of a road has been bad for several years and the reason that road is still bad is because there's a yearly allocation to fix that road. Mm. So if you're coming to fix that road, it means that you're sort of shutting out the money coming to an individual's pocket. Yes. What we try to do is not to put the money in the hands of individuals. So there's a structure behind our grants and sub-granting system where there is um, a way that we appoint a lead, there is a concept for it, there is a group fund that allows us to see how and track how the money is disbursed, um, but we also try to mitigate it by doing some kind of training before the actual disbursement happens. Mm. We have an integrity course, uh, values and moral um, leadership course that we offer as part of the training. So you understand that $200, $500, $1,000, $5,000 is not for you. And we've also seen a case where someone spent the money on themselves and came back to say, I actually used the money on myself and I'm going to refund it, and they did refund it. So there is this guilt trip that will happen to you when you know that this money should have gone into this, mm -hmm. but we also have set up a way to reduce our risk because the money is not ours. We still have to report to funders mm -hmm. what we've done with the money. And a better accountability system is for us to reduce the risk on individuals by making sure it goes into a group pool of funds, um, and then we actually pay the vendors, mm -hmm. in some cases, um, directly to reduce the risk as well. Amazing. So um, for the young person watching you right now, uh, how can they be part of this great initiative? Oh, every year we roll out the UDA of service, so we have a portal for that. If you go to www.ydos.org, you'll be able to find projects across Africa, across communities in Nigeria. Of course, Nigeria has the highest number of projects, mm. and you can just tap into that. Um, it's not a day, it's not a month for us, it's an annual campaign, but we typically open the portal at mm. the point, um, I think June, July, and we continue to, pro to, to do projects, implementation mm. all over the country and also in Africa till about September. We also give awards and recognition till December. So mm. anybody that wants to be a part of it can join us by January of 2025, but of course resources are available online on our website www.lipafrica.org oh, Definitely, I'll definitely be signing up. <laughs> um, yeah, so finally, how do you, because this question is very personal to me, Okay. Uh, because it breaks my heart every single time I, I see the African youth and how we're not able sometimes to compete. Mm. Um, we've seen several industries where we're doing well, entertainment, sports, we've been able to sort of make our mark mm. um, against all odds. So to the African youth, what, how do you think we're, we're, we can be able to overcome the economic challenge and all of the challenges that, is, that bedevils us constantly and daily to actively compete with our peers in Western countries? It's to focus on the solution. And we are quite good at that. Um, this is something just like it's passionate for you or, or personal to you, it's also personal for me. I think very strongly that we should have a solution mindset. Young people should have a solution mindset. When you do that, the way you approach problems are different. When you do that, you complain less, and you're trying to see how can we get out of this quagmire that we are in? What is the next step for us? Who do I need to talk to? Who needs to know about this? Who can actually support this? Where has this been done? By, by the time you, you, you ask critical questions, by the time you think about a structure around the problem rather than you know, fixating on the problem itself mm. and, and outsourcing it to somebody else like the government, your parents, your family, your friends, your uncles, and all of these people, I mean, the, the problem will persist. So for young people really need to, to look at the green light, to see the, the opportunity. And I think opportunities look like the light at the end of the tunnel, even when it's very dark until mm. you get at the end. Mm. But you're not going to see it until you, you advance towards it. So we need to take risks as young people. We need to take a bold step forward as well and be agile, be innovative, be dynamic. Mm. It's the only way. All right. Be agile, be innovative. It is the only way. That will, that's it. That's, that's, that's a wrap. Thank you so much for coming on the program. It Thank was you. so eye-opening. And please keep up with the incredible work you do. Thank you. Um, it's not every single day that you, you know, meet young people that are driving change. And I think if we have multiple people like you and, of course, your organiz organization, mm -hmm. um, the world and Nigeria will be a better place. Thank you so much for Thank coming you. on the program. All right. Uh, Robin Mind will continue after this break. Stay with us.
Welcome back to Robin Minds. And right now, we want to talk about the pressure of being a celebrity. Every now and then, we have a new star that is being made and stars shine as much as they can. However, we've also seen a lot of celebrities go into depression or battling with mental health issues. Um, sometimes celebrities delete their Instagram accounts. And, and every single time we have a community of people that are interested in what they do, how they do it, when they do it, and even suggest how they should do it. So with me in the studio, I have a man of many talents. He's an artist. He's an actor. I think he has dabbled into music at some point. <laughs> Saga, <laughs> Adi Olua, welcome to the program. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm very fine. I'm uh, an engineer as well. Oh, you're an engineer. You see? I say a man <laughs> of many talents. So first and foremost, I'm glad that your beards are coming back ah. because you looked a bit funny. Why did you shave your beards? I'm going to start with that. Well, what I can divulge, it was for a movie. Okay. You know, something, something good. But I cannot good. tell the title just yet. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I won't even allow you to tell the title because then it will be promotion and you haven't paid for it. Thank you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so walk me through this process. Yeah. What does it feel like to be a celebrity? When is one considered a celebrity? When is one considered a celebrity? I would say... Ah, what's the... Well, when you, when you become a public figure, you know, when you... Right now, a celebrity is someone that at least has, I, I can say, hundreds of thousands, up to hundred thousands of followers on, online. You know, because mm. some people are TikTok celebrities, some people are Instagram celebrities. You don't really have to be a movie star to be a celebrity these days. Mm. You know, some people are Snapchat celebs. Mm. You know, so when you start am amassing followers online, when when thousands of people start to know you, you know, as a regular person, I can guess you, you have a hundred. People that know you 200 well. Mm. Celebrity has a lot of people that know the, mm. that, 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 that or follows them or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So you shot into Limelight uh, with the Big Brother Niger. Yeah. Uh, what, what year was that? That was 2021. 2021. And you have evolved. You have evolved yeah. from just being a reality star. Um, I remember you did your art exhibition at yes, some point. It was brilliant. There was this particular portrait. Um, obviously, because of the platform we are, I cannot describe it, but it was very, very, very detailed. And also, you also attempted to draw yourself, yeah. pencil yeah. drawing. Yeah. And then you evolved. You've always had that talent. You also evolved into acting. Yeah. We've seen a couple of your you know, movies on yeah. several streaming platforms. Um, can you, why was it important for you to evolve? Why was it important, important for me to evolve? I would say um, because, you know, the most constant thing in life is actually change. Mm. You know, so we need to embrace change as it comes. You know, so um, you cannot remain stagnant in life. Mm. You know, when you try something, it's not working out. You tried it for a bit. Or maybe, maybe it's even working, but your heart doesn't go with it. You need to evolve, mm. you know. Even when you're doing something one way, one way all the time, it gets boring. You need to evolve. So these are the reasons that prompted me to take the steps I've taken. I've taken a lot of huge steps in life, and I thank God at least I'm mm. smiling. All right. Let's talk about your mental health, or yeah. generally the mental health of celebrities. Yeah. Uh, celebrities are very used to being trolled. Um, that's why they're so conscious of what they wear, where yeah. they go. Yeah. Where you, it's, it's, just, it's, just sort of, it's, it's just such a conscious life. So how does it affect your mental health when you see somebody that doesn't even know you physically troll you and say something not nice about you? Well, being a celebrity or being a person of influence is both a blessing and a curse. You know, for myself now, I would say I've always kind of been an influential person, you know, because I've held positions of leadership a lot of times in life, even in the church back then growing up. So I've always been an influential person. So I've had that, I've had that understanding that the things I do influences other people. You know, so... That can be both a blessing and a curse in the sense that a lot of people want to be like you. It's a good thing, but then it's, you have to be careful where you're, where you're leading people. You know, and then other times, people will also idolize you and place you on ridiculous platforms mm. that is inhuman, practically. So you can't make mistakes. They will judge you. They will drag you. you know, so you have to also be careful for your own mental health, mm. not because of them. Mm. You know, as I said, but I want advice that you are careful because of other people. Mm. Careful for yourself. Like now, I, I tell people that come into my inner circle, don't make videos of me and post without telling me. I want to know what you're putting out there because I don't want anything to backfire on me or my loved ones. You know, so that's how I, that's how I look at it. 
Mm. You know, I'm not, I'm not, uh, they can, they drag, when I cut my beard, they drag me, when I cut my beard, yeah. they drag me every day. Yeah. But I wasn't hurt because I knew I did it for something that would better my life. Mm. You know, so that's not dragging to me. Mm. But when, say, I make, I, I make it blunder, you know, and then people that, that, that looked up to me are now mm. let down, that's not good. You know, I, I would actually feel bad because I, I, I like to be a good example, yeah. you know, and I, I like to have a good name. Mm. You know, so I'm careful so that I don't lose that good name. I was raised in a home that name is worth more than gold. Yes. Yeah. Now let's talk about having to maintain a particular lifestyle. Yeah. Have you ever felt any pressure to maintain a standard of life just because of the fans? Because we've seen situations whereby a lot of people borrowed cars that yeah. were in theirs and posted yeah. houses that were in theirs. You know, particular mention, I'm sure you remember the Blessing CEO yeah. saga yeah. where she used another man's house and yeah. posted it as her house. And just so many cases like that, you know. Some people would call it the clout drug. So if I say that I'm not under any pressure, I would be lying. But I'll say every day I fight myself not to put myself under pressure. You know, I don't know if that makes sense. Mm. You know, because... You don't even have to be a celebrity to be under pressure. You just have to be on social media. I feel like that's the problem with this generation. Social media. Everybody has ridiculous standards. You have 16-year-olds buying G-Wagons. You know, so even a typical teenager wants to buy a car. Ridiculous. You know? So I fight myself daily not to pressure myself. Because I've always had the understanding that I am running my own race, which mm. is how everybody else should see it. You know, you're not, I'm not in competition with anyone. Mm. You know, so if... I am where I am in life at a certain level. I am satisfied with it. Mm. What I always do is I do my best at every point, given the opportunity I have. Mm. So when I do my best, whatever results I get, ah, what they mean to me, what they mean to me, what they mean to me. So I don't pressure myself. That's how I do That's good. It. That's yeah. good. That's good. Um, also, can you take us, have you ever at any point in your life felt like you were losing relevance? And I say this reoccur especially in the reality tv yeah, industry yeah. where after the show you're so popular you post a picture on instagram you're getting a hundred thousand likes one year down the line we have new sets of big brother celebrities or new reality stars and then your likes start reducing did you at any points were you conscious of the fact that you know perhaps people were not adjusting fully to your evolution Honestly, man, if I start talking about this, you're going to have to chase me out of your studio <laughs> because this is my life we're speaking about here. You know, I left engineering, like, I didn't have no idea about entertainment when I got here. It was a paradigm shift, you know, but then I had good people around me, my sister, my friends that supported me and were like, hey, they were like my eyes, Covering. They, you know, they, 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 protected, they protected me, they were my eyes everywhere. So they were able to advise me at every stage, you know, so... I don't think I've felt irrelevant at any point because to the glory of God, I've been able to manage my talents mm. and keep myself where I need to be. <laughs> you know, so I've not felt irrelevant. But then the fear is always there, you know, because a lot of people go to Big Brother thinking, you come out, you just have fans for the sake of it. I was never having that mentality because I had people that advised me otherwise. You know, you come out of Big Brother, you should put your talent out there. Don't just think... I have fans. Oh, they're going, they're going to support me. If you think that way, those fans will move on. But if you come to Big Brother, you show yourself as a fashion person or as an artist or as a singer or as a content creator, you know, or as an actor, mm -hmm. they would love you for that. And that's more long-lasting, you know, when you put your talent. That's what, that's what I've done. So. Now, what do you now think of those, especially those reality stars uh, that have shown their talent even while they were on the platform and then they come out, it seems like they're struggling with it. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's pathetic because I know a couple of people that are struggling out post the show. It's not easy, you know, and it's really nobody's fault if you have tried. But then I would say you should keep trying, you know, don't give up. Mm. But it's really nobody's fault, honestly, when I think about it that way. But then a lot of times people say, oh, say yourself on the show. Mm. Say yourself outside the show. That's the most important one. Mm. You know, on the show, people forget and they tend to only remember those very, very... You know, fight, that's what they remember, fight, love. They don't really remember, oh, this person was an artist. This person spoke very well. They don't remember all of that. So mm -hmm. when you come out, you need to really fight for your life. Mm -hmm. So fight for your life. I'm pray that God really butters your bread, really. All right, finally, this issue is something that we've seen over time. So yeah. we now have a movement of 
people lending their voices to issues. Yeah. Um, whether whatever issues, they just you know send the ring speak. lights and they speak. Yeah. Is this a new trend in the industry? Because we've seen new figures being formed. You know, some people would argue they're celebrities. Some people would argue they're not celebrities. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> other people would say, okay, you know what? These are cloud chasers. What is this trend? Honestly, uh, the trend you speak of. You see, this is this is this is the twenty first century, man. The world is changing. The world that we grew up in is, is different from this world that, is, that we have now. You know, so if this is the trend, I feel like lend your voice, but speak responsibly. That's mm. what I would say. You know, because I feel like it's a good time to speak. You know, it's good to be heard. You know, everybody has. What opinions. do you think of VDM? What I think of VDM. What I think of VDM. I think. Uh, I think I think he speaks his truth, you know. Mm. However it comes, he speaks his truth. A lot of people look up to him. A lot of people listen to him, you know. And then he's <laughs> putting light in a lot of dark places, you know. But then his approach might not be my approach, typical, because I'm a gentle person. I don't really, I don't like violence. I don't like stress. I just mm. like to go easy. So that's his approach. I wish him the best. Mm. But I feel like it's working for him. He has a voice. Everybody knows VDM. Mm. <clears throat> He could definitely monetize that if he likes, mm. you know, whether online, you know, we, all these social media platforms are paying money these days, or he could start a business or convert it whichever way he likes. So it's value. You know, I feel like um, influence is value these days. Mm. So I, I, pff, all it's right. up to him. And there have also been cases of people, um, there have been a lot of court cases these yeah. days, yeah. you know, yeah. among celebrities, between celebrities, between the celebrities and the fans. Yeah. Um, you know, some other people would argue there's freedom of speech, but of course, there's a fine line between freedom of yeah. speech and defamation. Yeah. So what do you make of all of these losses that has filled the industry right now? Oh, I'm sitting back. I'm enjoying the ride, my G. <laughs> That's just it, man. Like, I opened my social media and was like, wow, wow. And I tried my best not to be involved in none of that stuff. Mm. You know, because I like to keep my name as clean as possible. You know, I feel like celebrities should really tread carefully in all your dealings. Like, you have a responsibility to your fans. You know, people look up, to, like as I am now, a lot, I, you see my DM. Some people tell me my videos brighten their day. You know, so I don't want those people, I don't want to let them down. It's the people that I like or not, I owe them responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, do, I don't want my name to be dragged in a very funny way, you know, because... I don't want to go deep into that, should I? No, nah, it's fine. I could try. So the thing is, a lot of people are born followers. A lot of people are born leaders. Mm. You know, so some people are actually born followers. So you have to actually guide them. They need guidance. That's why they're online consuming and following people. Mm. Do you get me? So if you have people that follow you, it's your responsibility not to let them down. Mm. So control what you say, what you do, how you act, to, your best, to the best of your power. Mm. Yeah. So you don't get your name dragged because you can't stop those things from happening. It's the 21st century, man. Do you ever feel like that's a very high pedestal to be on? Because the moment you just make one mistake, yeah. it's like they're idol. It's pathetic, to be honest. It's not a good life. But it is the life we live in. The same, the same numbers that we use to make money, the same numbers that are going to drag us mm. if we make mistakes. So you cannot judge them. Because when, it, when a brand comes to me now that they want to push their product, All right. they're the same people we monetize. <laughs> Saga, we're out of time. Oh, Thank yeah. you so much for Thank coming. You. Appreciate you and I wish you all the best in your career. Thank you. It's been a wonderful time on Robbie Minds. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll catch you next week. My name is Hero Daniels. Goodbye. Stand